Aaliyah was a risk taker. In hip hop, we've been told it's a quote unquote young man's game. So for women to enter into that space, it's almost twice as difficult. Aaliyah was just graceful and poised and a very strong and courageous woman. I mean, she was at the forefront of so many things, fashion, movies. I believe if Aaliyah was still with us, she would be unstoppable. But unfortunately, fate had other plans. Aaliyah's plane crashed shortly after takeoff on Saturday in the Bahamas where they had gone to shoot a music video. I remember the news reports of it. It was unbelievable. I think when someone is so vital and so young and so much promise, it's just so shocking when you hear they're gone. Just one year before Selena's untimely death shook the music industry, a new female talent is stepping out on the scene. <laughs> I remember being completely taken by this artist because she just looks so cool. She's got the baggy pants, the midriff and bandana, the sunglasses. It was like, whoa. She had this like lower register voice that you didn't really hear coming from woman singers. To know that she was so young doing like all this incredible music, she held the world by storm. The princess of R&B, the queen of urban pop, one in a million, baby girl. Aaliyah Dana Houghton has many titles, but most people know her by a single name, Aaliyah. Aaliyah had self-identified as street but sweet. There was, there was always that balance for her, and it echoed throughout all of her music. It was like a mix of like urban but still R&B. Aaliyah brought an innovative sound that was uniquely her own. Rooted in her birthplace, Brooklyn, but reared in her adopted hometown of Detroit, where she moved at five years old with her parents and older brother to be close to their extended family. You know, coming from Detroit, she was very much, you know, inspired by a lot of the artists in Motown. Listen to a lot of Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye. My mother loved Johnny Mathis and Luther Vandross. That's when her vocalist mother encourages Aaliyah to hone her craft. Her father was her manager as well. So I just think she was primed from, the, from like seven years old to pursue a music career. Aliyah attended uh, GCU Catholic School, and that's a school in the area that's known for having this robust theater program. As a small child, she took part in, in so many musicals, including Annie. I was in first grade, and I just remember how much fun I had and how it was just pure bliss. Aliyah seemed to know from a very young age that she wanted to be a singer, and she, you know, she started on Star Search. Not too many kids in their single digits have that complete understanding of what it is that they want to do for the rest of their lives. But Aaliyah did. Barely out of elementary school, Aaliyah has her eyes on the prize, a record deal. But it's not an easy industry to break into. There was a lot of interest, but record labels just really didn't want to invest in an artist who was still so young. Still, Aaliyah has some star power in her corner. Aaliyah's aunt was Gladys Knight, I mean, a soul legend. Of course, that had to have influence. I remember she called my um, mother and asked, would I like to perform with her? And of course, I was like, yes, definitely. She ended up, like, you know, opening for Gladys Knight, which, what 11-year-old does that? The first night I was in, on stage, in the middle of the stage, and I just sang, sang straight up like a little broomstick, and then I just walked off, you know, no feeling, no emotion, and she told me, you can't do that. You have to reel an audience in. She credits that to being the, the real training for her, for her own stage presence. Because when you're that young and, and your aunt is a living legend, you learn a lot when you get on that stage. Then in 1991, Aaliyah's family connections lead to a pivotal meeting that will be her ticket to stardom. 
and infamy. Alia's uncle, Barry Hankerson, was managing R. Kelly and brought R. Kelly in to work on Alia's album. You know, working with someone like R. Kelly, you're setting yourself up for, for a big career, especially when he's the one creating the songs that you're about to sing. And once they had the biggest R&B artist working on this album, it became a lot easier to get Aaliyah a formal record deal. That became the starting off point around 12 years old. While R. Kelly provides the opportunity, it's Aaliyah's signature sound that makes her debut album, Age Ain't Nothing But a Number, stand out. I think it really set the template for what she would do later in terms of fusing soul, pop, and kind of hip hop attitude. When Aaliyah releases the album in 1994, it generates two top 10 singles for the now 15-year-old artist. You just really saw that she was beyond her years in talent. She already had a sense of style, a, sense, a, a presence that definitely felt older. But the pressure to mature faster than her years begins to take its toll on Aaliyah. At the time, it was very much marketed like Alia and R. Kelly were this, you know, producer artist dynamic. Came for the music, stayed for each other. And there was this strange way about how they interacted. You had R. Kelly, who was 27 years old, acting like he was a kid. And then you had Alia being very mysterious about her age. I want to wish you happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Now, now, you know, well, a man is not supposed to ask a lady how old she is, but you know, you're a young lady. I think I can ask. <laughs> <laughs> you know I love to have my age. It's a secret. But, um... It's only a number. It's only recently that the public has come to find out what Aaliyah was hiding. The full scope of what we are discovering about Aaliyah and her relationship with R. Kelly. It's really heartbreaking. When you break it apart, it's completely sinister. In 1994, Aaliyah's relationship with producer R. Kelly is a constant source of speculation. The album Aging Nothing But a Number, I think that the title was a cheeky nod to her younger fans, but now it just kind of feels creepy in light of what we know. Nearly 30 years later, the truth finally comes out. We learned that R. Kelly had a significant pattern in history with um, sexual abuse of, of um, young girls, including Aaliyah. In September 2021, R. Kelly's tour manager testifies about Kelly's sexual relationship with an underaged Aaliyah. What we are discovering about Aaliyah is the confirmation of R. Kelly being a predator to her. And when R. Kelly's advances reportedly lead to 15-year-old Aaliyah becoming pregnant, that's when the powerful music producer makes a hasty decision. But at the time, unbeknownst to all of us, R. Kelly kind of forced this marriage upon Aaliyah. With the goal of gaining legal consent to get an abortion for Aaliyah, R. Kelly takes the young singer to a Chicago hotel suite where the two are married in secret. But 18 months later, when Aaliyah's parents learn of the union, they immediately step in. This marriage was later annulled. That's when Aaliyah finds the strength to finally separate from R. Kelly. She left Jive Records, moved over to Atlantic Records. But there was a bunch of producers who didn't want to work with her because they were afraid that R. Kelly wouldn't want to work with them. The situation got super tumultuous that led to her almost being blackballed. Still, nothing can stand in the way of Aaliyah's dreams. In the fall of 1995, she continues to pound the pavement looking for a new music producer. It's really amazing and a testament to her strength that she was able to still be a force in this business, despite the shadow of R. Kelly. You had Jermaine Dupri, you had Dark Child willing to work with her, but the work that eventually became 
Alia's signature is working with Timbaland and Missy Elliott. Both Missy and Timbaland are still relatively unknown when they contribute to Aaliyah's sophomore album. Missy Elliott was in an R&B group and, and, and Timbaland was like a local DJ. And the way they found each other was because Missy and Timbaland caught when that Aaliyah was looking for producers and songwriters for her next project. And they were urged by Atlantic Records to give it a shot. So what they ended up doing was they flew out and they met Aaliyah and they cut a couple tracks together. And with Aaliyah now free from the constraints of R. Kelly, she's finally able to unleash her full creative potential. She was experimenting with like different sounds, different like key signatures, and really just evolving who she was in, as an artist. Like, who would put a baby sound in a song and it'd be very cool? Like, Aaliyah did it. In 1996, at just 17 years old, Aaliyah launches her next chapter with the release of her second studio album, One in a Million. It's an immediate hit that eventually goes platinum, cementing Aaliyah's place as an R&B superstar. Her ability to move from ballad to, you know, R&B pop to hip hop song was incredible. She was working with, you know, Middle Eastern samples against an electronic backdrop with a hip hop backbeat. So, so you started to really hear this sound that was going to become a standard for R&B music. I think it made a lot of people take notice, even maybe fans who weren't necessarily into R&B and soul. A lot of that had to do with the great video presence she had. A standout in the music video scene Aaliyah soon proved she has enough star power to take on Hollywood. We started to see Aaliyah everywhere. And after that, you know, she gets the role in the film Romeo Must Die. Aaliyah was obviously gorgeous, and she really had a charismatic sort of aura about her. Her role in Romeo Must Die, it wasn't the biggest role, but critically, it was praised. And it was just one of those things you knew she was going to be doing more. Aaliyah also lends her voice to the film's success. The biggest win from Romeo Must Die was the song Try Again. You know, it was never formally released as a single, and it made history as the first song to top the Billboard Hot 100 solely based on radio airplay. Over the next few years, Aaliyah contributes songs to six more movie soundtracks. She's literally the hottest thing ever. It's like, there's literally no avenue that she's not touching. In 1997, her song Journey from the Past from the animated film Anastasia even earns Aaliyah an Oscar nomination. Courage, see me through. Heart, I'm trusting you. So you have Aaliyah hitting these milestones and she really had only been out at that point for like five, six years. She was really just getting started. We were all kind of excited to see what would she do next. After just seven years on the music scene, 22-year-old Aaliyah has taken the world by storm. She can act, she can sing, she can dance, and she's still very gracious doing all of it, which is, I think, what elevates it even more because you feel like you know her, you feel like she's your friend. In 2001, Aaliyah begins filming her second feature film. Always a daring artist, Aaliyah seeks out a role with a bit more bite, starring as the ancient vampire queen Akasha in Queen of the Damned. The vampire queen in The Queen of the Damned and Rice's book, you know, that was highly anticipated. It was cool and it was different. What would be like the coolest role ever for you to play? I've done that. I've done it with um, Queen of the Damned, Akasha. It suggested that she was fearless in, you know, both her music and in her acting choices. By the summer of 2001, it seemed like everything was working out for Aaliyah. She had finished Queen of the Damned. Her music was coming back out. She was releasing an album after five years. It was the time, that moment before a star becomes an icon. It's a status Aaliyah hopes to cement that same year when she signs on to co-star with her idol, Whitney Houston, in the film Sparkle. Who are some of the people that, you know, you see and watch that, you know, you, you admire? Oh, 
Oh, definitely Whitney Houston. She was like my all-time favorite. Whitney was a guiding force for anyone who was a soul singer, an R&B singer. Whitney Houston was executive producer of Sparkle, a film inspired by Diana Ross and the Supremes. Whitney originally wanted Aaliyah to star in the film. She was our Sparkle. Um, unfortunately, it just didn't go that way. Just months before she's due to start production, Aaliyah travels to Florida to begin work on a music video for her new hit single, Rock the Boat. They filmed parts of the Rock the Boat video, and from what we've been told, the budget was too high to shoot at the beach in Miami, so they opted to go to the Bahamas. After two fun-filled days on the Isle of Treasure Key, the crew completes the video and wraps ahead of schedule. After the video shoot, um, they were really anxious to get back. So they did not use the plane that was scheduled and they called around and got um, someone else to do it. The plane changes from a regular size plane that could carry enough passengers plus cargo to this tiny little Cessna. And Aliyah gets to the airport and she doesn't want to board the plane. But options are limited on the tiny island. So Aaliyah reluctantly boards the flight. All of that cargo is now loaded onto a plane with Aaliyah and her crew and the pilot, including her 300-pound bodyguard. On August 25th, 2001, the plane carrying Aaliyah, a pilot, and seven members of her record label takes off from the Bahamas. Less than five minutes later, tragedy strikes. Around 6 p.m. in the evening, the plane crashed. Everyone on the plane died. It was just a really terrible situation. And at the age of 22, an icon lost her life. Police in the Bahamas said that one of the plane's engines apparently failed. The plane crash killed 22-year-old singer Aaliyah and eight others. Anyone who is around on August 25th, 2001, has their memory of where they were when they learned that Aliyah died. You know, there were, there were concerts that were going on, and in the middle of the concerts, people were finding out and then revealing it to the audience. And it was such a somber day. She's supposed to be on this red carpet. She was nominated for a Lady of Soul Award, and she's supposed to be here. And that's it. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. We have to stop taking things for granted. The kind of spirit that, that she has, when she met people, she always left an imprint on them. The whole music community really took it hard. You know, with artists, a plane crash is not an uncommon death. We, we've seen it happen. Richie Valens, Buddy Holly, Patsy Cline, John Denver. But with Aaliyah, it was, there was something different about it. And I, and I think it was because everybody knew just how close she was to hitting that superstar status. She was about to take over the world. I can only imagine what she could have been on screen as a film star. And let's not forget her fashion too. I mean, she would have been walking runways. She would have been designing her own clothes. I think she really would have been a force in changing how women maneuver in this business because she was right there at the beginning and she really had the world at her fingertips. Eventually the Rock the Boat video released. <laughs> Queen of the Damned released in, in 2002. From the decades after her passing, so many people without her there borrowed from her and took these little bits of her, these fragments of her style fragments of her sound, and applied it to their own art. There's definitely something about her music, her style, her body of work that is truly timeless. Adele has spoken of Aliyah's influence, Halsey, Normani, The Weeknd, Rihanna. There's a point where it's like, who hasn't Aliyah influenced? She was pure heart, pure passion, pure soul. 